Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. Today, Jim Wilson has lots to show off in the Victory Garden South, and Roger Swain has tips for caring for strawberries and shows us how to plant a new tree. Marion cooks with broccoli, and I'll be back with the last call for entering this year's Victory Garden contest. That and more is just ahead, so stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. By the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide, renting tools and equipment for home gardening and entertaining needs. And by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's professional concentrated liquid plant food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out. Jim Wilson's feeling pretty proud about his garden in Georgia. He sent this report. Let's have a look. Good morning and welcome to Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia. And one of the things that the visitors like to do in early morning here is to take the miles and miles of pathways that meander through these woods and to take their families on bike trails. Now, three months ago when we were here, those woods were ablaze with zellias. But now I've got another plant I want to show you. It's right over here. It's the sourwood, Oxidendron arboreum. It's a native plant to the southeast. It grows on acid soil. And Bob, you might have a little trouble relating this beautiful thing to that puny little plant you got up there at Lexington. But this plant will grow to about this size throughout the southeast, all the way up to southern Pennsylvania. And the thing we like about it is that it's a practical size for lawns. It colors up real early in the fall and these beautiful flowers are a source of honey, the famous southern sourwood honey. So if you're in the market for a practical size lawn tree with a lot of attributes, think sourwood. When you come to see Victory Garden South in midsummer, this is what will greet you, a planting of Hyperion daylilies, brilliant yellow. But what will really knock your socks off is this approach to Victory Garden South a flowery alley of a hundred feet of heat-resistant annual flowers, and it takes you right over to Victory Garden South. Let's go see. There's a lesson here in heat-resistant flowers that will bloom all summer long in the South. And we stair-step this big border, starting in the back with the very tall, giant sunflowers, and stepping down to giant, tall, cactus-flowered zinnias in a bright orange shade. And then in the center of the bed is a flower that's just taking the south by storm. It's a jawbreaker of a name, Melampodium, but boy, does it put out flowers. And this one that we've shown you before on Victory Garden South is the classic zinnia. Now, tying all these hot colors together is the maroon color of one of our favorites, a red shield hibiscus. And this leads you right over to Victory Garden South. Oh, yeah. I see the rabbit eye blueberries are just about ready. These plants, though, I see are suffering from that almost terminal disease that's called finger blight. Just can't resist them. I got a plant here I want to show you running all over the place. It's not kudzu. But if you guessed kiwi, you'd be right. This is the famous kiwi vine. And in about two months, this will be nice and soft and ready for picking. Now, with kiwis, it takes two to tango. You have to have a male plant as well as this. And you have to have a lot of room for this big, aggressive plant to spread out over strong supports. Now, speaking of heavy fruiting like this, I've got some sweet corn I want to show you. This late crop of Silver Queen sweet corn's already eight feet tall. It's still going. Just started to tassel, so we know that in about three weeks, we're going to have good eating corn off of there. But I've got a shorter, earlier hybrid that's just about ready now. It's Merritt. And Merritt has been around a lot of years in the South, and it's still hard to beat for a good eating variety that will stand up to the rigors of our Southern summers. And I just got to get in here and taste one of these ears. Let me find one that's where the silks have turned brown. Let's see what we got here. Snaps fairly easy. 
Look at that. Look at that. Just at the milk stage, what I mean by that is if you put your fingernail in there, see that milk squirt out of it? Can't let this one go without testing it. Mmm. Terrific. Mmm. Now that I've had breakfast, let's go over and see Victory Garden South. The lawn has done a great deal of growing since we were here the last time. We've had a lot of spring rains for which we're very grateful. And our cold rutaria, our golden rain tree, looks so pretty. The seed pods are now beginning to follow the, those decorative yellow blossoms that you've seen earlier. And it casts some shade that's appreciated by this planter of coleus. This is really a vivid, vivid plant. This is brilliantissima growing in a great big terracotta container. Now, what holds this all together is this planting of scented geranium with filigree leaves that thread their way in amongst this coleus just the same height. Doesn't that make a beautiful combination? And how about this one? This is a lower growing container of really hot colors. This is a portulaca down here hanging over, trailing, softening everything. And that individual blossom is a hibiscus. And yes, you can grow it across the Mid-South as an annual. And this is blue salvia here. You remember when we were here the last time we planted this uh, strawberry jar of herbs? How do you like the way it's grown? With the chives coming right up there. And here's a little plant of tricolor sage that's just doing marvelously. And a little spicy globe basil. And here in the center, it's going to look a lot better later on as it grows is a plant of rosemary. And behind it here is another container of warm colors. This is Melampodium again. And this is a little uh, Senecio here. It's not Dusty Miller, but it's just as pretty with the cut silvery leaves. And again, the uh, red shield hibiscus that is just holding this together like glue. Now, if you like hot colors in containers, come over here. Look at this. Here's Celosia Century Mix. And down here is one that I think is going to perish shortly, but uh, they put it in for its uh, beautiful orange color. It's tuberous rooted begonia. We'll probably have to replace that with a heat resistant flower shortly. More Melampodium. A little bit of red salvia over here. And just what they need in the middle to hold all of it together is a white multiflora petunia. Now, we don't have much to show you in the vegetable garden at this time of the year. We're in between our spring crops and our later plantings that will mature this fall, but we're bang on for this one. Look at the color of this ageratum with just a little violet in the blue and how it agrees with this crimson red celosia and behind it. And we've planned ahead for the fall. This is Autumn Joy Sedum. Back here, it doesn't look like much now, but later on it's going to color up and dominate that entire garden. And we we'll use a lot of blue to divide these colors that might otherwise clash. And this is Salvia Farinaceae Victoria. I want you to see over here a most unusual combination you might think that this is a strong grass coming up through this verbena tenufolia, which is one of our native heat-resistant verbenas. This is not a grass. This is a hardy gladiolus. It will come up above this and give us flowers in a, a number of different colors. And another one that we're growing from bulbs, we haven't seen this one previously at Victory Garden South. How do you like this? This is Acidanthra, standing up there just as beautiful and white with those vivid purple centers. Now you might think there's just one white flower in here, but actually there's two. This is a southeastern native plant that we call spider plant down here, but it is actually hymenocalish. You grow it from bulbs. It's hardy up through zone seven. Take a look at the barberry here. Nice, big, dominant purple plant standing up there in the corner. And it looks so good when it's not overused. You don't want to overuse purple colors. And out in our cottage garden, the tall plants of pink hollyhock coming up. And we're just in time to see 
heavenly blue morning glory and pearly gates morning glory over there on the fence. A little later, they'll close. And just beyond them, we have Cleome, pink queen. We're going to actually cut these plants back a little bit later so they'll branch and give us a second show of color. And a little bit down from that, I don't want you to miss this, is some uh, zinnias that we're growing for cutting. And this is a mixture of colors called ruffles mixed. And last but not least in this cottage garden is our cosmos. Now, this is the sensation mixture of colors, purple and lavender and white. And it's totally unlike the hotter colors in what's called the bright lights mixture. Let's go over and revisit Natchez. And Natchez is our favorite of all the crepe myrtles. And you can see why. Look at that huge spray of white blossoms. And beyond that, we've got this nice tree form. And this bark is just unbeatable with the modeling uh, effect. Now, we've shown you sweet corn today, and we've shown you blueberries. Let's go up to the suburban garden and see what Roger Swain has for us. Well, hello there again. Welcome back to the Suburban Garden. How do you like this bouquet with owl? It's called the hollyhock mallow, and the flowers aren't as big as ordinary hollyhocks, but what they lack in size, they make up for in abundance. It's a real mass of soft pink, and it will go on blooming for a long time. It's a real easy plant. Not only does it come back year after year, but it self sows, so you'll get new plants springing up all over the bed. And I think it fills this gap here in the wall of lilac very nicely, and the owl, all the owl seems to approve. Now, here in front of me is an, another plant that's not terribly common. It's, it's Echium vulgari. Now, this is not the wild plant, which tends to be a little bit weedy, but this is a, a selected cultivar, and it's a nice blend of light pink and dark blue, light blue and white. It makes a nice rolling bed, soft, easy pastels, gentle on the eye. Last year, we put in a new bed of brambles. Well, you look at this cane. This is a black raspberry. And boy, that's just one year's growth, and that's still going. And if we didn't have it staked up between wires like this, why, it would climb up and arch over. And in the fall, it's a tip rooter. In the fall, you'd get roots at the tip, and the plant would, would root in the ground and, and move across the landscape that way. We've already got a few fruits. Look at the size of those. Now, you have to understand that just a century ago, the only black raspberries around were the wild black raspberry. The black raspberry is native to the eastern United States. Rubus occidentalis is the species. And there are the fruits, little black caps. There used to be a commercial industry in western New York growing and selling dried black caps. And these were the fruits they started with. And look what a little breeding has done. A century later, we've got this jewel with fruits bigger than my thumbnail. The other end of the bed, we've got a raspberry that came to us from New York State with just a number, New York 114. Well, this year I've learned that it's got a name. It's now called Ruby. It's a good-sized fruit. That'll be ripe in just a few days, and I'm looking forward to a taste. Our main crop of raspberries got hit pretty hard during the winter, and we had a lot of dieback. I'm still going to get some nice berries in here. See there? And that looked pretty good, and the, mm, well, the flavor is exquisite. The trick with raspberries is to keep after them. Mm, keep the beds well mulched. You notice we've got bark mulch down between the aisles. Boy, it's hard to tear myself away from them. They are good. I want to show you this perennial favorite around here. It's, it's an annual zinnia called Dreamland. There are five or six different colors. We chose this one, it's Dreamland Pink. Because when these are gone by, we're gonna get a splash of color from this Sedum Autumn Joy, which will be a nice rose coming on late in September. So we'll go from the zinnias into the Sedum Autumn Joy, and it'll be a nice flow of rosy pink. Now this is our new grape trellis that we built this spring. Two wires, high one here, a low one here. The aim is to train grapevines into a forearm Niffin system. There'll be two canes on the bottom wire, two canes on the top wire. I've got two good canes down on the bottom already. 
I'm training them up on the top here. Got a lot to work with. But when the wind blows, these young shoots occasionally break right off. And so to hold them in place, it helps to just wrap a string lightly around. It doesn't have to be a very fancy tie. Once the chain is started on its way, the tendrils will wrap around the wire quickly enough and hold itself. You can see that it's running along very nicely under its own power here. I see down here that there's actually a single cluster of grapes. Just a teaser here of taste to come next year and the year after when we begin to get serious crops. But this spring, I cut almost all of the shoots off this. Next spring, I'll do the same, leaving just two canes down here and two canes up there. Right now, we're really building a root system and the basic scaffold of the grapevine. Our strawberries, there's not much to pick anymore. We've been in here all through June picking fruit. Had this been a June bearer, there wouldn't be any more berries until next spring. But this is a new kind of strawberry. It's called Tribute. It has a sister called Tristar. They're day neutral berries, which means they're unaffected by daylight. They go on blooming all summer long, one flush of bloom after another. You can see the, another flower there, another young strawberry just forming. Here's a little bigger one. We'll be picking berries July, August, September, October on the frost. We're also getting some runners. A runner is the strawberry's natural means of reproduction. You'll see, oh, well, there is a ripe strawberry. Look at that. Isn't that a treat? Mm, a reward for showing up. Runners are connected to mother plants. You can see it's connected to the base. It's come out here, and it's making a little plant. And there's a root growing out of the bottom. And then I'm making another shoot, run out and make another plant. If I left these in the bed, I'd wind up with an awful lot of plants, and they'd all be competing with each other. The foliage would be crowded. There'd be a lot of leaf diseases and fruit diseases and problems with that. It won't get enough air drainage. So ordinarily, one removes the runners simply by tugging them off and discarding them. But what I'd like to do is put in another strawberry patch. And rather than going out and buying plants, I'm going to raise a few of my own. And let me show you how I'm going to do it. Just take a three or four inch in diameter flower pot, fill it with a good potting mix, and then cut around and select a runner. Here's a good one. You can see the roots beginning there. And I'm just going to take a little pin, nothing fancy. It's just a piece of bent coat hanger, fold it over to make sort of a bobby pin, and taking strawberry plant and pressing it down into that potting mix. I'm going to pin it in place with that wire pin, just gently hold it in place, keep the wind from moving it, set it there, keep it well watered. In four to six weeks, that plant will have been fully rooted. I can cut off the umbilical cord that connects it to the mother plant, move it wherever in the yard I want, and replant it. A real simple way to increase your strawberry crop. Now, the next thing on my list today is to go plant a tree. Come on. It used to be that the only time you could plant a tree was early in the spring, or maybe if you lived in the south in the fall. But now, thanks to container culture, I put a tree in almost any time in the growing season. Of all of the cedars, this is my favorite. This is the blue atlas cedar. Cedrus atlantica glauca. And I think of all the blue conifers from the Colorado blue spruce to blue rug juniper, I think this is the truest and nicest blue. The plant gets a little bigger. It'll have the added attraction of two to three inch cones on these branches that persist all year long. Now, I've chosen this corner of the yard because this is going to get to be a big tree. In 10 or 15 years, it'll only be 10 or 15 feet high, but in 40 years, it's going to be 40 feet high and nearly that broad. It's not the sort of thing you put in the landscape casually. When this is grown, it's going to spread all the way out there, all the way down here. Think about siting. The hole, I've already dug the hole, should be just as deep as the container. Let me just double check that. That's about right. It used to be that people would mix a lot of organic matter into the hole, a lot of peat moss or rotten manure. The problem with doing that is you create a very nice, fertile soil, 
and the roots from the tree just run around in that fertile soil and they never leave. They never go off away from home exploring for nutrients. And so when a hurricane comes along and blows, what happens? Great big tree, small, tight little root ball, over it goes on its side. Total loss. So the trend now is not to improve the soil in the root hole, but rather to let the roots go find their own nutrients. Save your organic matter and use it for mulch on top of the ground to conserve moisture. That's the proper use of organic matter. All right. All I have to do, and it's easier said than done, is pull this thing out of its pot. Oh, my heavens. That is heavy. Oh, up it goes. Now, the only trouble with containerized plants is sometimes the roots do get a little congested at the bottom of the ball, but I don't see any circling roots. If there were, well, I'd get my clippers out and snip them off. But that is a real nice root ball, and it's just a matter of carrying it over to the hole. Now, when you put a tree in the hole, pay attention the way you want it to sit, because it's a little hard to move around after you've got it planted. Now, I like, I like this curve leaning a little bit forward. There, that's pretty good. I'll just horse that around, maybe a little more vertical. Now, doesn't that look good? All right. Now, it's just a matter of backfilling around the root ball, doing it carefully, being sure not to leave any voids. And now it's just a matter of building a good dike to form a saucer around the base of the tree to hold water. Remember this dike is above soil level. It's built up, not dug away. There, now water. And it can't give a newly planted tree too much water. It's going to have a good flooding here. All right, now these two stakes, when I've tied the trunk to them, will keep the tree from rocking out of the hole before the roots get into the surrounding soil. Okay, these wires pass through cut sections of garden hose so that the wire itself doesn't cut into the trunk. Now, the most important thing with any newly transplanted tree is to water it every week doesn't get a heavy rain. Water is a lot more important than additional fertilizer to get trees off to a good, strong start. Now, come on back to the vegetable garden. I promise to pick some broccoli. Boy, it's been a tough year to grow cauliflower and broccoli. You really need cool, even temperatures, and the thermometer has gone shooting straight up and then back down and then up again. And the result is that our broccoli is not its best. You can see that these have already begun to bloom, little yellow cabbage flowers. This head, on the other hand, is pretty nice. Just what Marianne, I think, can use. This is a great recipe for a night when you don't want to spend much time in the kitchen. Broccoli and pasta soup. Everything goes into one pot. And I took about a pound and a half of broccoli, and I cut off the flowerets, and then I took the stems and peeled them, just like this with a paring knife. And then I cut the stems into small pieces. And now this broccoli is ready for the pot. Over here, I have about a tablespoon of oil heating in my soup pot, and I'm going to add half a cup of chopped onion and about two carrots sliced, peeled and sliced, and a quarter of a cup of ham cut into little pieces. And I'm going to stir this all around and let it wilt just for about two to three minutes. Mmm, this is smelling good already. Now, here I have some minced garlic. I keep it covered with oil, which keeps it very nicely, and I'm going to put in a good heaping teaspoon of garlic. That will smell good. And then three tablespoons of tomato paste. And then we need some liquid. I've got six cups. I have three cups of chicken broth mixed with three cups of water. And I'm going to bring this to a boil. I'm going to put in the broccoli stems first because they need a little bit more cooking. They're going to get a one minute head start. And now the flowerets go in. And then the pasta, two cups of macaroni twists. And these will cook for eight minutes or until the pasta is just tender. Notice I didn't cover the soup, by the way, because this way the broccoli stays nice and green. Now for a little seasoning, a little bit of hot pepper sauce, a little bit of salt, and black pepper, and this is ready to serve. And as quickly as one, two, three, here's dinner. 
served with Parmesan cheese and hot pepper flakes. The Italians have a word for this. Bravo! That was very well done indeed, Marion. Well, folks, this is the last time I'll have to encourage you to enter our Victory Garden Contest. Who knows? You might even be this year's winner. But the one thing I'm sure of, unless you enter, there's no chance in winning. We've made it awfully simple. Here's how. Entering the Victory Garden Contest is easy enough, provided you're an amateur gardener. Simply send a photograph, no slides, please, and a list of the plants you're growing in your window box or container. Send those along with your address and phone number to Victory Garden Contest, 125 Western Ave, Boston, Mass, 02134. Eligible entries must be received by Monday, July 24th. All entries become the property of the WGBH Educational Foundation and are not returnable. Our judges will soon be on the road looking for this year's finalists. And in a few weeks, I'll begin to show you who those lucky folks are. Well, thanks for being with us today. And please come back next time when we visit a delightful, tiny garden right in the heart of Brooklyn, New York. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. By the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide, renting tools and equipment for home gardening and entertaining needs. And by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's professional concentrated liquid plant food for all home gardening needs indoors and out. Now, home improvement is easy with helpful hints from Dean Johnson and Joanne Liefler. Useful decorating tips to advice for the dedicated do-it-yourselfers. Spend some time with the hosts of Home Time, next on KCPT. Victory.